Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. So today we're doing episode 4 of Junior Doctors on the Front Line and this is the last episode available to watch on BBC. If you haven't watched the previous episode, I'll leave it linked up here. Let's start. All doctors are required to do general shifts called on calls, covering 10 wards and up to 350 patients. Wow. So if you miss me, you miss me. It's more things like home. Because this is where like my first rotation was, so like, I recognize everyone. Good to be back. So they hand jobs to you. Okay. Hi Zahid. Yo, what's up? Wagwan. Wagwan. But lucky for Zahid, this weekend he'll be sharing the shift with fellow junior doctor Halra. How are the jobs looking? We've got eight. Fine. So that piece of paper there, that's the jobs list. So when you're on call, the bleep just doesn't stop going off. So you jot down every job that's coming through and then you have to prioritize and decide who you're going to see first, what you're going to do first, what can wait up until later on. And depending on how that on call is going determines how many jobs on that list you get through or whether you finish the shift with two pages worth of jobs <laughs> that have not been done. We've all been there. The important job they have is responding to the bleep, a device that allows nurses all over the hospital to contact them about patients needing care. Obviously people are bleeping you for a good reason, but I think the noise of the bleep, there's no one in this world who would you know, say this is a great sound. Ah, no. uh, it literally just goes through you. The bleep, man. One of the reasons I'm going to train to be a GP, that that bleep is just not the one. We're forced to hold the bleep when we're on call. And when it gets really chaotic and the bleep's just running off and running off, and sometimes <laughs> you're just like, oh, please be quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bleep. just need two minutes. I'm happy to start the bleep. Do you, oh, you, you do that? Yeah, I quite like carrying the bleep. I'll take that. Oh, bro. Tara, she's gone. She's taking the bleep as well, which is good, because I don't have to hear its voice uh, for some time. Tara can bleep the whole day, that'd be a dream come true. Most of the doctors wouldn't want to carry the bleep. No. So if you're on call with me, then you're alright. I don't think I've come across anyone who would like to carry the bleep. So if you do, then hey, <laughs> you'd be very popular. Live for the bleep. <laughs> <laughs> on my first day, I started off on call and that bleep drove me crazy on the first day. It was so stressful. <laughs> But now I love it. So when patients need either recurrent blood tests or um, regular transfusions, rather than having to, you know, use needles repetitively, we can sometimes put a line in, so it makes it a lot easier. But the issue is they can get infected, and that's what's happened in this case. So that's something like a pick line, that's an indwelling catheter. Rather than, you know, using a needle each time to take blood from someone, they can have like a pick line in, which you can use to give them things, fluids, antibiotics through one port and another port you can reserve for taking blood, for example. Therefore, in theory, causing less distress than sort of sticking a needle into someone repeatedly. When you go to take blood and a patient tells you, no one ever gets my blood, and you're like, oh man, I'm never... Your heart kind of sings a little bit, you're like, oh, fingers crossed. <laughs> but usually it's an opportunity for a bit of chit-chat just to sort of put the patient at ease and put you at ease as well. <laughs> We're from the ENT team. We're here to see your ear because you've got a little bit of bleeding into the, into the ear itself. Today, Luke has been called to an 86-year-old man who's fallen down the stairs and injured his ear. I won't show the full procedure here, but the ear can be quite sensitive, especially to injury. So you can have blood pooling between the skin and the cartilage, a hematoma essentially. And that can cause the ear to be misshapen. You've probably seen it in boxers, wrestlers, the so-called cauliflower ear. So that's what you try to prevent in this case, and uh, you drain out that hematoma. You allow the ear to heal properly. A patient has been brought into a &E overnight. Hello. How are you doing? with a severely swollen throat. Have you felt generally all my Alex was shaky yes. or hot? Shivery, sweating, handling profusely. Really? Yeah. Okay. Swollen throats are a worry. Like I mentioned in the previous episode, you know, when you assess a patient, there's this thing called the A to E assessment. The A literally stands for airway. So if someone's coming in with a swollen throat, then you worry about the compromise to their airway, to their breathing. So that's usually something that needs to be dealt with very quickly. In this case, I wonder if she's got tonsillitis or something. Use your voice. <laughs> I don't know what you normally sound like, so... Yeah, it's quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. Your throat is so swollen. Like throat. So just say, uh... The patient has uh, quinsy, which is like a, an abscess beside the tonsils, and that collection of pus is going to keep growing, and 
maybe even burst on it, which would be a bit less pleasant for it. I'll show you a picture of a quinsy. It's, it's essentially an abscess at the back of the throat. It can be a complication of tonsillitis sometimes. If it's not treated, left for a long time, it can make you quite unwell. We'll numb up the back of the throat first, mm -hmm. and we swallow a bit of thin needle, yeah. quite long thin, and uh, we'll try and get as much as we can. So, just try and hold it. Actually, quite an apprehensive person. The only thing is, in medicine, sometimes you're just called on to be confident. Oh God, I'm dealing with that life. And particularly if you're doing a procedure and the patient doesn't want to see someone that doesn't know what they're talking about. And sometimes that means acting. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, "No, I've done this a million times." I feel like you have to look like you know what you're doing. It's part. It's part of it. She's not looking sure. <laughs> She's not looking convinced yet. Sticking a needle in someone's throat isn't something that really comes naturally or uh, easily. When the needle goes into the quinsy, then when you pull back the syringe, it collects a bit of pus in it just to drain it out completely. So that's what he's looking for when he's pulling back the plunger. Make sure you're in the right place and you're getting the right stuff. So just draining a little bit now. I can see a little bit of pus coming out. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Let me just see if I can. So it's probably in the right place. Maybe the needle is just too narrow or something to drain stuff out, but it looks like it's now draining on its own. Swab and get some. Sorry, sorry. It's probably not going to be the nicest experience, but uh, it's easy. We'll skip forward a bit. Usually it's quite rewarding, you know, you get to the end of the day, you have actually done quite a lot. George? George? She's been called to see a dementia patient who's become unresponsive. So in a situation like this where a patient is unresponsive, you're not quite sure what's happened, that A to E assessment would come into play and that's what most people would go through to try and work out what's going on. 87-year-old George came into hospital with a urinary tract infection and delirium. So delirium just means acute confusion and you do see it with patients with a significant infection. Uh, in elderly patients, a urine infection or urosepsis can cause delirium. George, I'm just going to shine a torch into your eyes, okay? You get little nuggets of information, bits from a patient, bits from a family member, something from the scans, something from the bloods, and you piece it together to find out what's wrong. The pupils are really small, but unreactive to light, um, and he's not had any pills, so maybe it's something intracranial has happened. Looking at the eyes and the reflexes can give you an idea of what's going on in the brain. However, there are other things that can give you a small fixed pupil. Opiate-based medications can do that as well. So she was double checking that that patient is not on any opiates. So the next thing would be, well, is there anything going on in the brain then? So you order a brain scan, maybe a CT scan, and then take it from there. Hi, uh, my name's Hara, I'm one of the doctors. The fact that George isn't reacting to light is a red flag to Haura. So she's ordered a brain scan. Cheers, thank you. Bye-bye, bye. Four hours later, the scan results are in. Oh, his scan looks horrible. You can see, compared, if you compare the two sides, one side, so I'll use my mouse here, one side, this side, you can see it's got all these nice folds and uh, this dark space, this is the ventricle. Uh, so you've got uh, cerebrospinal fluid in there. But look what's happened on this side. It all looks, you lose that definition. And, and essentially, this is what a stroke looks like. And this is, this is a big stroke because you can see it's covering most of this side of the brain. It's just really sad to see. Yeah, all of that side. I'll just speak to the stroke registrar and they're going to take out this care. And hopefully they'll be able to manage him appropriately and at least give him, you know, a better quality of life than if we'd spotted it later on down the line. Yeah. But yeah, it's really important that we got that scan done. Howard's quick thinking hasn't gone unnoticed by the on-call senior doctor. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks. I'm glad I picked that one up actually. As a junior doctor, there is nothing better than a senior doctor telling you you've done something right, mm, you've made the right, right call, your judgment is right, and it just makes you feel great. It makes you feel like you're doing your job properly. Jean is also looking better, and the urology team have decided not to treat her kidney stone for now. <laughs> but because of Jean's age, Arturo has asked Zahid to lead a routine but sensitive discussion with Jean's son 
about what happens if she were to get seriously ill. So they were just talking about kidney stones there. So in a lot of cases, the way you treat a kidney stone is that, so first of all, kidney stones are very can be very, very painful, right? It's essentially minerals that have come together and formed a stone, so in the kidney. And then when they get into the tube, going down to the bladder, that's when they get stuck and that's that's very painful. So the way to treat them is they put in a tube, a stent that goes from the bladder to the kidney, bypassing where the stone is, allowing the kidney to function as normal. Because if there's a blockage, you can imagine, that can impair your kidney function. Some time later, they then go in with a laser and break up that stone and then clear it and then remove that stent. So obviously that's a procedure. So the idea is to weigh the benefit and the risk and see where you are. Um, it sounds like in this case, they've decided not to do, to do that and manage conservatively and see how they go. My biggest aim coming into this ward uh, when I started about two months ago. Uh, this is the one thing I want to get good at because it's not easy. I do feel a bit scared of doing this conversation just because I think it's a matter of life and death and you know what, in these sensitive matters where the relatives are here and you don't want to get things wrong. Hello. Hi. You know, talking about this subject of resuscitation, so if that situation was to arise, what would the patient want? Have they had that discussion before? That sort of thing. So I'm guessing this time he's going to do it and the consultant will just watch and give you feedback at the end or jump in if they need to. I've got one of the doctors here. How are you doing? How are you doing? And that's my consultant, Dr. Otto. How are you doing? <laughs> if um, you don't mind just coming up with it. Is it okay if we take your son away for a couple of minutes? <laughs> I'm just going for a chat. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> I think the great thing about her is she's improved so much. Yeah. Um, from when she came in and so I think she's had a great rate of recovery uh, but obviously with these things we want to plan in advance of um, things before they come and one of the issues that we want to tackle is things about possible resuscitation status. Um, has anyone had a discussion? Well yeah I've had this discussion that uh, my thought is quality of life and if we get to that stage she's not going to have any quality of life. Yeah she? and that, that's normally what we see because obviously if someone's heart does stop beating um, it's going to involve us going on the chest, putting tubes down uh, the mouth and, you know, invasive things like this. So we think that even if she does successfully recover from that, her quality of life will be very poor. And those are the issues we have and we think maybe in her case um, it might not be appropriate. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. I fix boilers for a living. You look after human beings, so... Whatever you think is... Yeah, and I know it's, it's never an easy decision to make because... I know that, I know that. Um, it's the head heart battle I'm saying. The yeah. problem with me is my heart always wins. I feel like that was... You made that serious. Yeah, fine. Is there any other questions? I know, I think you've, uh, you've covered everything now. I know, and she's done really well. And we're happy that we can do that for her as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see her smile again. <laughs> yeah, she's been... It's an incredibly difficult discussion to have. But I feel much, much uh, more confident doing them and now I feel like I'm happy to be, you know, go and do them independently without anyone supervising me. So a, a couple of them are in their second year of being a junior doctor. So after that, you then have to decide what you want to do, what specialty you're going into, or do you take an F3 year, which is becoming more and more common. In that year, you can locum, you can do clinical fellowship, you can do other things just to get a flavor of what you really want to do before you commit to a training pathway. Um, because after that, you have to apply exams, interviews to get into the training program you want to do. So you take all of that into consideration before you move forward, which is why I think a lot of people take an F3 year. So that's pretty much the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching. And that is the end of this series, Junior Doctors on the Frontline. If there's anything you want me to react to, let me know in the comments below.